Well, last week, I told you all uh, about a particular day in my life. I told you about April 19th, 1972. And I just told you that was the year I was eight years old, and my mom sat down with me on the front porch of our house and told me that my, my dad had passed away. And I mentioned to you all that even as a little boy, in that moment, I remember thinking, God, what is that? You know, what is going on? How could something like this happen, right? But of the days in my life, that date, while a defining moment, was not what went on to become sort of the defining moment in my life for a lot of years. And that date's April 13th, 1978. April 13th, 1978 was also a beautiful day, just like April 19th, 1972. I was uh, on the school bus. I was coming up the hill. We lived on, on a little road aptly named Cedar Hill. There were A, lots of cedars, and B, it was a big hill. And so the school bus is coming up the hill, and, you know, other students on the bus began to say, what is that smell? And I could smell it as well. And as we got near my home, I could see the front of my house. I had moved to the front of the bus. I was standing right next to the driver waiting to get off. And through the window, I could see my house, and I could see huge, a huge column of black smoke just pouring out of my house. And I stepped off the bus and just looked at my home, trying to understand what I was seeing. And it just hit me that my home was on fire. And so I threw down my books and everything right there in the driveway and ran around to the back of the house just as I was going, praying that my mom's car wouldn't be there, she wouldn't be there, that the house was empty. But as I got around to the back of the house, it was a two-story home, I stood beneath the window where my mom's bedroom was. And I could hear her inside. So I tried to go in through the basement, and I made my way to the stairs that went up to the main part of the home. Couldn't do it. Fire was just everywhere. I come back out of the house, come around the front, and as I come around the front, uh, my best friend, one of my best friends, lived next door across the street from me. His dad was home that day, had seen the fire, and had come across the street. And as I came around the house, I told him, I said, my mom is inside. And he said, you wait here. And he risked his life to go into the house. And he came out with my mom. But it was one of those things where you just know what's going on, Right? And it was too late. My mom had passed away. I took my mom to the hospital. Uh, a dear friend of the family, Dr. Walker, was uh, the attending physician that day at the hospital. He and my dad had practiced together for a lot of years. And Dr. Walker worked and worked on my mom, but to no avail. And he comes down. I had gone on to my grandmother's house. who lived just down the road. And Dr. Walker came to our house, and I'll never forget when he walked into that house. And the look on his face said everything that needed to be said. And I'll never forget my grandmother. And she cried, not my baby, not my baby. And it was devastating. Over the next few weeks, people would come up to me at school and in town, a little small town, everybody knows your business in a little small town. And people would come up to me and they would pretty much say the same thing. They would say, I'm sorry, which I appreciated very much. And then inevitably, they would try their best to find a story that would be similar to my story. And they would say something like this. They would say, I know how you feel. Now, by the way, have you ever said anything like that to somebody who's really hurting? I know how you feel. I'll, full confession, I've said it. <laughs> But as they would say to me, I know how you feel, I would thank them for their caring. But you know what I was thinking on the inside? You have no idea how I feel. You understand what I'm saying? What, can, what could compare to that moment? I felt so incredibly alone. Because in my own mind, I felt like nobody else 
could understand my life, what I was going through. And if you, uh, if you were up here today and you had your own story of trauma, and I know so many of you do, I'm not unique. Everybody, it seems, gets to take their turn at suffering. The question is when and how, right? If you were up here telling your story of trauma, you would be able to connect with just how isolating it is. If you faced abuse or neglect or profound loss, You know that you can be surrounded by people, good people, who mean you well. And you can feel completely alone. And that loneliness can be absolutely overwhelming. Sometimes the loneliness has more of a profound effect on our life than the trauma itself, right? We look at the scriptures and we see loneliness. In fact, did you know that God recognizes the danger of loneliness? When God surveyed creation, he, he sees over and over, it was good, it was good, it was good, right? As he looks at creation, you know the first thing that God declared not good? Loneliness. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, then the Lord God said, it is not good for what? For man to be what? Alone. God looks at all of creation, all of it, checks the boxes, it's, it's awesome, it's incredible. He sees man by himself, mm. That's not good. Loneliness may not be good, but when you look at the Bible, you see story after story that tell us about the reality of loneliness as as people who loved God intensely dealt with profound loneliness. You look at the great prophet Elijah in the Old Testament, and you're looking at a story of loneliness. He cries out to God. You look at King David, incredible leader, incredibly gifted guy, And yet, he cries out to God in loneliness. You look at Jesus Christ, fully God himself, second member of the Trinity. And on the cross, what do you see? A cry of loneliness. Matthew 27, 46, my God, my God, why have you, what, abandoned me? In that moment, Jesus felt the intensity of loneliness. It seemed to him that God was completely absent. So I just want you to know that that if you've ever faced trauma and that trauma has left you feeling alone, you're not by yourself. You're in the same company as Elijah and David and even Jesus himself. But today I want us to just sort of telescope in on the story of one man who suffered in a way that I think most of us can't even imagine. The, the trauma that he experiences leaves him feeling cut off from, from God, his family, his friends, his community. And if you or someone you know is dealing with the reality of loneliness that hardship brings, I want you to really dial in today because there is a lot that we can learn from this story. We're talking about Job this morning. Job is a, a, a man, he was a key leader in the Old Testament Uh, There's an entire book of the Old Testament named after him. He was a wealthy businessman. He was a concerned father. He lived in a a place called Uz, think modern-day Syria or Jordan. And in many ways, he is absolutely living the dream. Listen to how the book of Job begins. There once was a man named Job who lived in the land of Uz. He was blameless, a man of complete integrity. Just let that line soak in on you. He feared God and stayed away from evil. He had seven sons and three daughters. He owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 teams of oxen, and 500 female donkeys. He also had many servants. He was, in fact, the richest person in that entire area. Job's sons would take turns preparing feasts in their homes, and they would also invite their three sisters to celebrate with them. When these celebrations ended, sometimes after several days, Job would purify his children. He would get up early in the morning and offer a burnt offering for each of them. For Job said to himself, perhaps my children have sinned and have cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular practice. As you look at those verses, I would submit to you that in many ways, Job is a role model for every single one of us in here. He was a man who was prosperous. We'd all like to know what that's like, right? I was talking with someone the other day about Mike Norvell's pay raise, $10 million a year. I don't want his job, but maybe for a week, you know? (laughs) Actually, his job is not the one I want. The one I really want is Jimbo Fisher's job. (laughs) 
<laughs> that was not in my notes. I just... <laughs> Job was a guy who found enormous success. He was incredibly wealthy. When you go through the data points of his wealth here in Job chapter 1, it is just this incredible list. If we were to write this today, we would say he had this money in the bank. He had this much money in stock. He had, this was his portfolio is basically what we're looking at here in Job chapter 1. And not only that, he was a man of incredible integrity. And you all, he modeled what it meant to love God in front of his family. He even found a way to lead his adult children well. Let me tell you, that is a real challenge. Job had figured it out. And from the looks of it, if anybody deserved the good life, it would have been Job. But if you're familiar with the story at all, you know it doesn't stay this way, does it? Satan approaches God in the throne rooms of heaven and he impugns Job's character and he tells God, let me just do a number on Job. And I'm telling you what, after I'm done with him, he will curse you. So God permits it and Satan unleashes his very worst on Job. He wrecks Job's finances. He wipes out his servants. All of his children are taken It's an absolute bloodbath. And Satan doesn't just stop there. He goes after Job's health as well. And by the time that Satan is done with Job, he's reduced to scraping his wounds on the burned out ash heap of his life, quite literally. He is suffering in a way that I can't even imagine. Everything that he had swept away in a moment of just unprecedented evil. Have you ever known of somebody and that's their story? Is it your story? Several years ago, I get a phone call from one of our church members. And he'd seen this news report on the television the night before, and it just struck him to his core. It was a news story about a family that had been traveling from Disney to their home in Iowa. Mom and dad and their three kids. They were over in Gadsden County driving down the interstate when a pickup truck crossed the median and hit their SUV. Dad and two of the kids were killed instantly. One child in intensive care. Mom relatively untouched. And this church member had seen this news story and said, I just can't imagine what that would be like. Not only to, to, to suffer in that way, but to suffer in that way when you're hundreds and hundreds of miles from home. Is there any way that we can do something for this family? So I went online and, and I found the news story and got the, the name. I went to the hospital and I you know, was able to find her room. And I went and stood outside her room. And just looked inside, and there sat Erin as she looked at her daughter, Kaya. And you all, one look at Erin told the whole story. She was absolutely wrecked. And in that moment, I thought, what in the world can I say to this woman who's suffered in this way? She understood, did she not, what... It meant to sit on the ash heap of your life, right? And that's Job, right? He's shaken absolutely to the core. And as I know and understand the reality of what Job faced here, as I consider that, I'm blown away by Job's response to it all. In Job chapter 1, verse 20, Job stood up and tore his robe in grief. Then he shaved his head and fell to the ground to worship. He said, I came naked from my mother's womb and I will be naked when I leave. The Lord gave me what I had and the Lord has taken it away. Praise the name of the Lord. In all of this, Job did not sin by blaming God. Wow. So Job tears his clothes and shaves his head. It's what people did in Job's day to demonstrate their grief. But in even the worst of his moments, Job found a way to hang on to his faith in God. Y'all, don't you know that he must have hung on by a thread? That's at this point in the story that Job has three friends who show up. 
And they have this incredible conversation about suffering. This conversation runs on for the next 28 chapters in the book of Job. And it's just this raw, unvarnished look at the reality of pain and suffering. And you all, I'm going to be blunt with you. Job's friends do not get everything right. Okay? They say some outright boneheaded, knuckleheaded things. Right? But they're there. Now, if you read the story, one of the things that just makes such an impression on me, when Job's three friends show up and they see Job at a distance, the Bible says, they begin to weep and they begin to wail. And they come near Job and they climb up on the ash heap with him and they just sit there for seven days. Now, his friends go on to say some things that are not exactly on point, but when we all agree those are real friends right there. You've got somebody who will come and sit on the ash heap with you for a week and not say anything, that's a friend. But eventually the conversations do ensue. And in one of those conversations, Job describes the profound loneliness that he feels because of everything that he's faced. And I want us to just zero in on that conversation for a couple of minutes. Job 19, verse 7. Job says, I cry out, help, but no one answers me. I protest, there is no justice. Job speaks to his friends about the loneliness he's feeling. He says, nobody really understands what I'm going through. Nobody gets it, and because nobody gets it, nobody's able to be much help. <laughs> and then Job goes on to add, and by the way, y'all, it's not just people... It's God too. Look at what he says about his relationship or about how God has related to him. Verse 8. God has blocked my way so I cannot move. He has plunged my path into darkness. He has stripped me of my honor and removed the crown from my head. He has demolished me on every side and I am finished. He has uprooted my hope like a fallen tree. His fury burns against me. He counts me as an enemy. His troops advance. They build up roads to attack me. They camp all around my tent. Job says, hey, listen, you know how I feel right now? I feel like God has come to me and he's built a wall around me. But this wall, the wall that God has built around me, it is not a fortress. It is not a stronghold. It is a prison. And God's just got me pinned in on every side. And no matter where I turn, no matter what I try, I feel like on every hand, there's an enemy against me. Then Job says, and, and what I've experienced with God, that's only the beginning, okay? And then he talks about his experience with other people. Verse 13, my relatives stay far away and my friends have turned against me. My family is gone and my close friends have forgotten me. My servants and maids consider me a stranger. I'm like a foreigner to them. When I call my servant, he doesn't come. I have to plead with him. My breath is repulsive to my wife. I'm rejected by my own family. Even young children despise me. When I stand to speak, they turn their backs on me. My close friends detest me. Those I loved have turned against me. Wow. Job says, my relatives, gone. Closest friends, gone. Neighbors, gone. My sense of respect, gone. And then if there's any kind of comedic point in this entire text, it's got to be verse 17. And in all of this, I'm sitting here on the ash heap, covered with boils, and my wife says, dude, your breast stinks. <laughs> really? Thank you, right? Thank you so much. I am, I am feeling the love, right? No wonder verse, uh, in verse 20, Job says, I have been reduced to skin and bones and have escaped death by the skin of my teeth. Mm. You blame Job for feeling that way? I mean, man, that's the way that trauma works. Have you noticed that when you get into a season of trauma, it is one hit right after the other? Does it, it, doesn't it just feel like you can't get a break? Right? Things seem to be going along just fine. You go to the doctor for a regular checkup. You get hit with a diagnosis. And it throws open the doors to surgery and medical procedures, and it just drags out forever. Right? 
And after you go through all of that, all of the suffering and the pain that all of that involves, then what happens? Then you start getting the bills, right? And they can't send just one bill. You would think that the hospital, the doctors, the labs, they could all come together and work as one. But no. The hits just keep on coming, right? It's like there's the bill for the doctor, there's the bill for the surgeon, there's the bill for the anesthesiologist, here's the bill for the janitor, here's the bill. Everybody wants their cut, man. It's just one thing after the other after the other, right? And your friends, the people around you, they don't understand. They just like send you a text with a thumbs up emoji, hope you're getting better, right? Now, do you not realize what I am going through here? That's exactly where Job is. Let me tell you, that kind of loneliness is profound, it is deep, and it, it kind of feeds off of itself, right? It just sort of forces you further and further down. And the longer it continues and, and the more that this kind of spiral into trauma kind of runs, the more isolated you feel. And as you look at it in Scripture, you go, well, what is God's remedy for this kind of loneliness? I mean, is there any hope? Is there any way out of this? And I will tell you that, yes, there is a biblical remedy for this kind of loneliness. And it's not complicated. But it's also not simple. Maybe some of you in here have run a marathon. Maybe some of you have dreamed of running a marathon, but just have never realized that dream yet, right? Is running a marathon complicated no, it's decidedly uncomplicated, right? Just go out to the streets, start running. Is it easy? No. Start running and don't stop until you've hit 26.2 miles, right? Running a marathon is not easy. Is it complicated? No. Is it easy? No. God's solution, if you will, for loneliness is not complicated. And before we move into it, I just want you to understand, if you're dealing with trauma, and I begin to kind of, as we kind of begin to unpackage this, you're going to think, what in the world are you doing? Do you know how hard what you're describing is? And I just want to be on record before we even get into this. Yes, I do. Because God's remedy for the loneliness that we often experience in trauma isn't complicated. But it isn't easy either. So we're going to look at Romans chapter 12 and begin in verse 9. Here Paul just sort of lays out the practices that need to be evident in and among God's people if we're to push back against the, the evil that has a way of disrupting our life. Look at what he says in verse 9. Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident home. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Here Paul is sort of laying out, okay, as a community, if you want to be the kind of community that can stand in the face of evil, that can, can stand in the face of trauma, that can really truly deal with the kind of loneliness that that triggers, then what you need to do is you need to develop relationships that are what I would call trauma-ready relationships. They just need to be insanely healthy relationships. And then he goes on to describe here what those relationships might look like. They're loving. They're incredibly genuine. They reject what is evil. They embrace what is good. They take delight in honoring one another. They are patient with one another. They pray for one another. They serve one another. They show each other hospitality. Paul says, listen, this is the kind of relationship that you need to have of in your life in the midst of incredible hardship. This is what you need. Don't Pretend to love, really love. Hate what is evil, love what is good. Take on the reality of evil. 
And let that evil just press you into a greater affection for one another. Let it press you into a deeper relationship with God. Let it call you to a higher degree of serving. Let it call you to a higher degree of maturity in your prayer life. Let it call you to a higher degree of hospitality. Paul says, listen, when you're faced with evil, you need in your life trauma-ready relationships, and you have to take a role in making those relationships happen. I'll hear people say to me, uh, well, yeah, I was really hurting and I went to the church and no one seemed to care. I sat in the worship center. No one said anything to me. No one offered me a casserole. It was just isolation. And I left there going, nobody in the church cares. And Paul says, listen, you need to understand if you're going through those kinds of moments in your life that are incredibly lonely because of trauma, you have to push your way in. And you might be wondering, well, when is the right time for me to build what you're calling these trauma-ready relationships? Is it before? Is it during? Is it after I've experienced trauma? And my answer to you would be yes. Before, during, and after. Listen, there is never a wrong time for you to develop the kind of healthy relationships that Paul talks about here in Romans chapter 12. I don't know about you, but I need all of those kinds of people in my life that I can possibly get. Amen? I need all of them that I can get. There's never a wrong time for you to press in and develop these kinds of relationships. In fact, the sooner, the better. The sooner, the better. Because when we experience, when the, when the moments of trauma hit us and we're, we're facing trauma, our tendency is to do what? Our tendency is to shut down. Our tendency is to sort of to, to withdraw inward and, and just hope that we get through this thing. And yet, what do we need? We need a caring community to come around us. We need those trauma-ready relationships. And so God's solution to the kind of loneliness that we experience as a result of trauma is to invest in people. You all, we're going to get into this next week. I don't want to get into it much today, but I will just say this. I do not know where I would have been without the good people of First Baptist Church of Waverly, Tennessee. I don't know where I'd have been. And that's really kind of the focal of next week. We're going to get into that very thing. But you all, if you're hurting, if you're dealing with the reality of trauma in your life, you've got to lean in to healthy relationships. You're going to need them. You're going to need them. And then Paul goes on and he says, and by the way, these healthy relationships aren't just limited to the people that you need to support you. You need to ask yourself what a healthy relationship might look like with the people who are hurting you. He deals with that in Romans chapter 12, verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people and don't think you know it all. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. You know, we, we've talked about how sometimes our suffering is caused by evil in this world, right? We've said sometimes our suffering is caused because of the ridiculous things that we do to ourselves. And we've said sometimes our suffering is caused because someone sins against us. Paul addresses that last category and he says, listen, think very carefully about the relationship that you have with the people that hurt you. If you're suffering at the hands of someone else, think about that relationship and make sure that you are handling yourself in a way that is honorable. Don't assume you already know everything. <laughs> when somebody hurts you, have you ever found yourself doing this? Oh, I know what they're thinking. That person right there, they hurt me. I know what they're thinking right now. And because I know what they're thinking, I'm going to do da 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 right? We just begin to think that, well, because of what I've experienced at their hand, I know 
all there is to know. Paul says, don't, don't fall into that. Do all you can to live in peace. Now, does this mean that I do not seek justice? Of course, that's not what it means. Of course, that's not what it means. It's not good for you. It's not good for them. Okay? Does it mean you should just ignore what happened? Of course, that's not what it means. You should absolutely deal with great integrity with what happened. Does this mean that you shouldn't draw appropriate boundaries with that person so they don't hurt you again? Of course you should draw appropriate boundaries. It's not saying any of that. It just means that as far as you are concerned, as far as your conduct toward them, let what you do be honorable. Sometimes when we experience the pain of trauma, we make sure that we take other people down with us. Paul says, don't go there. Make sure that you do all you can to be at peace with people. Now, before we wrap up, we've got to come back to Job chapter 19 for just a moment. Because after Job pours out his heart, and after he says, God has imprisoned me on every side, after he has said, everybody, everybody, has abandoned me. Look at what he says. Job 19, verse 25. But as for me, I know that my Redeemer lives, and He will stand upon the earth at last. And after my body has decayed, yet in my body, I will see God. I will see Him for myself. Yes, I will see Him with my own eyes. I'm overwhelmed at the thought. You know, in the Bible, you run into this idea of a redeemer pretty often. And the reason is it it has both legal and religious connotations and meanings. The redeemer is that person who would step in at just the right time and and redeem a piece of property that you were about to lose and it's facing foreclosure. And your redeemer steps in and says, hey, how about I take care of this? That's, That's a redeemer. Your Redeemer is that person who would step in at just the last moment because in their day, if you got into real debt, they sold you into slavery. And so at the last moment, your Redeemer would step in and say, I I got this. It's all good. And they would pay the price for that not to happen. In in their day, the Redeemer was the person who would step up into the courtroom and stand in front of the judge just before the judge was about to throw the book at you and say, I got this. Let me cover the fines. I'll take care of everything. That's a redeemer. And in the reality of faith, our redeemer is someone who will stand before a righteous and holy God and look at us in our sinfulness and say, I got this. I'll take care of it and I'll take care of it all. And as Job considers all that he's been through, as he considers the trauma and the pain and the agony and everything that he's gone through, he's certain about one thing. His Redeemer lives. And he says, I will see him, I will see him, I will see him. My Redeemer lives. And you all, I just want you to consider this. If you're facing trauma, and isolation today. I would simply say to you, don't do it without a Redeemer. And Jesus Christ stands before you today and he says, come to me. I will be your Redeemer. And I will take what is broken and in ashes and I will make it new. I'll make it new. So would you today consider saying yes to your Redeemer. Let's pray together right now. Father, we love you. We're grateful to you. And I know that in this room right now, there are people who are going through just incredible seasons of difficulty and trauma. And it's just like the hits just keep on coming and everywhere they look, they don't see anybody who seems to care. And I just pray that this church body becomes that place, that Romans 12 kind of place that pushes back on that loneliness by being genuinely loving, genuinely caring, genuinely hospitable, 
And so, Father, I pray for those who are in this room today who are dealing with profound loneliness. I just pray that today's the day that they take a risk, that you grant them the courage to take a step and say, I'm going to find a way into this community because I need a remedy. So, Father, I pray that that occurs today. And then, Father, for those who are here today and they are far from you and they know it, they know it. Let today be the day that they cry out and they say, Dear Jesus, will you be my Redeemer today? We love you, Father, and we pray this in the beautiful name of Jesus Christ. And everyone agreed and said, Amen.